The Healthcare Security Cast is sponsored by 3D Network Technology. www.3dnetworktechnology.com. Welcome to the Healthcare Security Cast, the podcast dedicated to healthcare security, safety, and emergency management. If you are involved with a healthcare security program or desire to be, this podcast is for you. Join the conversation as we discuss the issues that matter to healthcare security professionals while leveraging the expertise of healthcare security thought leaders and experts in personal development. And now, here's your host, Brian Hamilton. Welcome to the Healthcare Security Cast for Wednesday, March the 11th. I'm your host, Brian Hamilton. Connect with the Healthcare Security Cast on social media by joining our LinkedIn group, the Healthcare Security Cast community. We also have a Healthcare Security Cast page on Facebook, and feel free to connect with me directly on social media. I do have a Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram account. I'm easy to find. I'm the only Brian, B-R-I-N-E, Hamilton on any of these platforms. And depending on the platform, you can also use the handle at Brian Hamilton. A couple of quick announcements before we get to today's show. The IHSS Ontario Chapter Educational Seminar scheduled for today had to be canceled, and we're hoping that we'll be able to reschedule this event for a future date. Tomorrow, Thursday, March the 12th, the IHSS Boston Chapter is having a joint meeting with the AS's Boston Chapter. On Friday, March the 13th, the Boston Chapter is also hosting their March breakfast meeting. For more information on either of these events, connect with Brendan Riley. On Friday, March the 20th, the Connecticut Chapter is also having a breakfast meeting. And on Thursday, April the 2nd, the IHSS Los Angeles Chapter is hosting a meeting as well. For information on either of these events, you can reach out to Katrina Welsh and Mark Reed, respectively. Also, all of these meetings will be linked below by using the IHSS Community Calendar link. I also want to highlight a couple of online learning opportunities as well. On Wednesday, March the 18th, IHSS will be hosting a webinar conducted by Jim Sawyer. The title of this webinar is Healthcare Security Support to the Homeless. And as always, webinars are free for IHSS members. A week later on Wednesday, March the 25th, Ralph Cummings will be hosting Body-Worn Cameras in Healthcare Security Special Interest Group. This is the second virtual discussion, and there's a limited number of participants, so register as soon as possible if you're interested in being a part of this discussion. If you'll be in the Toronto, Ontario area, on Monday, July the 13th, the IHSS Ontario Chapter is hosting their 16th Annual Golf Classic. This event has raised over $110,000 for cancer research in partnership with the Princess Margaret Cancer Foundation. The link with more information for this event and to register as well as sponsor is linked in the description. We'd also like to highlight some in-person learning opportunities that are upcoming. On Thursday, April the 16th, if you will be in the Princeton, New Jersey area, the local IHSS chapter, in coordination with the New Jersey Hospital Association, will be hosting the 2020 Healthcare Security and Safety Conference. There's a phenomenal list of presenters for this event. If you join this podcast using the link from LinkedIn, the presenters are listed in the special mentions. And finally, on May 4th to May 6th, the International Association for Healthcare Security and Safety will be hosting the annual conference and exhibition in Phoenix, Arizona. The link is also provided for this event, and there's still opportunities to register as well as sponsor. And now today's discussion. In this podcast, we'll be discussing drug diversion, a topic that probably doesn't get the attention that it warrants. And we'll be joined on today's show by Bill Lisevsky. And now, let's get into today's content. Thanks for joining us today, Bill. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Who is uh, who is Bill Lisevsky? Well, sure, Brian. Well, like, like most uh, security director practitioners, I had a career in law enforcement, and I think that's a, a really good carryover uh, skill set. Uh, especially being uh, a police prosecutor, I spent a lot of time in court. Had a canine unit, was second in command of a small department in New Hampshire, so really got to, to wear most of the hats that I wanted to in law enforcement. And I've been in uh, director level for security since 2004 and immediately joined the IHSS uh, in 2004. I've been very active with them and 
uh, quickly got the CHPA designation, got really interested in things like the Lindbergh Bell Award, so I went after that, and then in 2010 was able to uh, to capture that and uh, had uh, my last department uh, with the program of distinction, and we renewed that three times and working towards that uh, in my new opportunity here in Pennsylvania. Awesome. All right, and our, our focus today is going to be on drug diversion. So we, we do have quite a few people who listen who aren't necessarily healthcare security practitioners. So can you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about drug diversion? What, what is drug diversion? Well, in its uh, simplest form, you know, drug diversion is actually uh, the transfer of a controlled substance from a lawful channel to an unlawful channel. And it's, and it's a direct, uh, you know, issue. It's, it's a criminal act involving a prescription drug. And it's very prevalent in healthcare. They say six to ten percent of healthcare workers are involved in drug diversion. Uh, so that's a, that's a pretty big percentage. And a lot of facilities are really not geared up and, and how to adequately handle it when it comes their way. Uh, it could be a very complex, uh, and devastating experience. Uh, if you don't have the skill set and, and a team to to manage it uh, properly. Okay, and and you said six to ten percent of workers are are generally involved. That we, well, we believe anyways. Uh, who are the typical diverters in the healthcare environment? Well, it's basically anyone that has access uh, to the drugs. You know, I've seen uh, technicians, you know, pop the caps off of uh, certain controlled substances, pull out the actual drug substitute it with saline or even uh, contaminants or water. Nurses are probably the biggest diverter of it because they have access to it all day long. They're very smart, very well-educated people, so they know how the systems work. And typically, in, in about 90% of the hospitals in the U.S., you're, they're running around with their heads cut off, so there's not enough oversight of the actual transactions involving drugs until something happens, and then they start looking at records. So uh, probably in the last five years, there's been a lot of different computer programs that have come out that, that has allowed the the staff, uh, the management staff, to actually look more closely at at the transactions, and that's actually uh, been an act, you know a good tool to, to catch them before uh, you have a big issue. Great. Now, the one thing that you said there was uh, obviously you're running around like, chickens with their head cut off in that environment. So that makes me think right away of, uh, of, an, of the emergency department. Would you say the emergency department is where you see the most diversion, or where does it usually occur? Well, it actually can occur in, in different areas. Obviously, an emergency department is very busy, so there's certain methodologies that uh, and taxes that they can deploy down there. For instance, uh, you know, somebody will wait until they have to waste some medicine and they'll wait for a trauma to come in. You know, they might hear an ambulance is 10 or 15 minutes away, and, you know, two minutes before the ambulance is supposed to arrive, they'll they'll ask somebody to witness a waste, and, you know, they'll say, well, if you're busy, you know, I'll just go over to the sink here and take care of it, and, you know, the other person really doesn't think much of it, and they're actually, you know, signing on that they witnessed a waste that they really didn't see. Uh, so they'll they'll take advantage of the, uh, the busy uh, time over there, um, to to divert. Uh, a lot of times, you know, a patient doesn't get their full dose. You know, half the half the uh, the medication is going to the diverter. Somebody's supposed to get two pills. They make that one, and uh, it's just a, a myriad of ways that uh, they can go about uh, for a long period of time diverting. And typically, when a diverter is caught, it's been going on at least 18 months on, in general. Wow. Wait, now, what are what are some of the most commonly diverted drugs? Mainly the opioids. You know, it used to be oxycodone was was uh, the big one, uh, but I've seen, in my experience, Dilaudid and fentanyl uh, to be the drugs of choice. They're the most powerful drugs that are out there, so uh, you only need a little bit to go a long way. Um, so I would say, in my experience, uh, Dilaudid, fentanyl. And uh, oxycodone uh, is probably the big ones, uh, but they'll also get into antipsychotic drugs, uh, 
basically anything that's uh, opioid based, uh, if they get desperate enough, um, they'll divert that. But generally, a diverter has a drug of choice. So when you start an investigation, you know you'll find if, if it's dilated that it's their drug of choice. You'll see sloppy um, handling of that particular drug more than the other one. So you can really kind of uh, focus in on on uh, what what their drug of choice happens to be. Okay, and there is um, I know there's a lot of ways that diversion happens, and you mentioned one example specifically where where practitioners will take advantage of the busy times. Uh, what, what are some of the other things that you've seen, other other, method, other methods of diversion, I guess, if you will? Sometimes people will actually come in on their day off, uh, so you'll see a card swipe and, and uh, you'll see, okay, why is this person in? Uh, they're going into med rooms. They'll often um, ask to help out um, on busy narcotic pain floors. Uh, they'll volunteer to give pain medicine, they'll say, you know, they'll tell the other nurses, I know you're busy and Mr. Jones is going to need his shot. You know, I could take care of that for you. Sometimes you'll see uh, withdrawing medication without an order and they'll, they'll say it was a verbal order. And, uh, you know, if they get uh, caught with that, they'll say, well, it was a verbal order from the doctor and I guess he didn't write it down. And if that happens once or twice, you know, people won't really think too much of it because it's, it's a busy place. Sometimes they'll say that they dropped the pill and it rolled on the floor and they can't find it. Those are usually something that you can catch if you're if you're looking at your uh, your analytics. Uh, I know one particular case. Uh, a nurse uh, grabbed me. She was asked to to witness a breakage um, of a capsule on the floor. And when she got over there, she noticed it was it was completely dry. She thought that was really odd that if this this drug had just broken. You know, there would have been a wet spot. So um, that's how I initially got called into that particular one. And again, you know, when we looked into the investigation, it had been going on for months and months and months. So that is a couple of different ways. Um, the, the the biggest thing that we see is wasting complete dosages. You know, they'll they'll take a drug out, uh, let's say 200 micrograms, and uh, you know, it's not needed, and they waste the whole thing, uh, which is really you know, a huge red flag. And then uh, they remove the uh, the drug under somebody else's sign-in. Uh, when they go to the, the drug machine and someone else signs out a drug, there's a lit- if they didn't immediately sign back out, that person will go back into the cabinet under the other person's name and, and retrieve a drug. So we've seen that as well. And I'm sure um, personal usage is probably the biggest reason for diversion, but what are some of the other reasons uh, somebody may divert drugs? Well, a couple of times it was for a family member that, uh, you know, had an accident or, you know, became addicted to pain uh, pills and they didn't want them to get arrested, you know, buying, you know, street drugs on the street. So they're actually supplying a family member, you know, with drugs that, you know, they hopefully wouldn't overdose with it because they knew the uh, uh, the potency and the integrity of the drug. So a lot of times the diverter themselves are not taking the drugs. They're supplying it to a boyfriend or, you know, a loved one or a significant other, uh, and they can get caught up in it that way. Or sometimes they just sell it. I mean, the, uh, the price of narcotics is so high that if uh, they want to make some extra money, they can sell these pills or... Uh, the injectable. So it's a myriad of reasons why they're diverting. How can diversion, basically, how would it impact an organization and as well, how would it impact patients? Well, that's that's the, the biggest uh, concerns. Uh, you know, when you're running a, a healthcare facility, you know, the, the worst thing you want to have is your organization and the press for anything that's not positive. Uh, drug diversion can be extraordinarily devastating to an uh, organization's reputation. There was a hospital in New Hampshire that uh, had a significant drug diversion that affected about 100 patients. Wow. And their their bottom line fell down that they, they weren't able to give uh, merit increases for about three to four years. And they were even thinking of renaming the hospital to something else until they were finally able to turn it around. So it could be extraordinarily devastating uh, for that to be out in public because you're 
in a hospital and you're you're trusting these caregivers to do the right thing. So that's uh, that's one of the really key issues. And then, of course, you know, the, the patients uh, that are not getting the pain meds that they're supposed to, you know, they're their discomfort and and they're in there for a healing and nurturing environment and uh you know they're they're not getting their rest they're not getting better because uh their pain is not managed uh, adequately so it's really a two prong really negative effect uh when you have drug diversion going on now what are some of the things as practitioners that we can look for to recognize potential drug diversion well you really have to learn about it you know, what i've uh, found is uh not enough of the nurse managers, directors, HR people have any real background in doing these type of investigations. Um, I joined an organization called the National Association of Drug Diversion Investigators um, over uh, 10 years ago, and uh, within one or two years, I was able to, to build my skill set to uh, an extraordinarily higher level than what I came in with, because you're working with uh, people that specialize in drug diversion. So there are some organizations, there's some training out there, um, and with uh, the percentages of 6 to 10 percent of uh, the population in healthcare diverting drugs, you really need to uh, invest in your staff and at least have uh, a core group of people that have that kind of training and could adequately manage an investigation. Otherwise, you're, uh, you're kind of chasing a rabbit's hole. Right, and you mentioned the the education piece there. Is there is there anything that you do, I guess, in terms of employee orientations? Like, would, would, is this something that you would talk about? Yes, uh, I started probably uh, almost ten years ago. Just about every security director does an orientation part for new hires, and uh, I talk very specifically about drug diversion, and that uh, there's several members. Uh, on staff of, of NATI, National Association of Drug Diversion Investigators. And I tell the nurses, you know, over a 30-year period, what the value of their nursing license is worth, you know, for total income. And I just tell them and caution them, you know, please don't jeopardize that, that RN license, you know, for somebody else. If you see something, say something. And, you know, if you're getting 100 people at a time, you know, once a month coming into your organization, you know, that's a good way to get the word out that, that we are looking, we, we understand it, we have a, um, you know, a plan for it, and it may really, you know, temper somebody that may want to divert and they'll say, geez, you know, I, I remember they, they talked about that and they have this whole task force and everything. I, I probably don't want to do that with this employer. Now, would you be willing to walk us through the, the process? What is it, what does a typical drug uh, diversion investigation look like? Uh, generally, there's, you know, let's say a, a, a missing count, you know, uh, at the end of a shift, they're, they're, they're trying to reconcile, you know, it's almost like a bank, you know, one teller to another, uh, and they're off by uh, by a couple of items. So that, that may trigger it, or it might be that, uh, you know, a nurse or a practitioner or somebody uh, appears to be under the influence and impaired, That that's probably... Uh, a large uh, percentage of it that it comes in that way, or they're making mistakes or, you know, taking long breaks and missing for quite a period of time. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, HR and security and everybody else is involved to say what's going on here. That's probably the most typical way that um, a case is usually brought forward is, is somebody detects something, either an odor or glassy eyes or somebody nodding off, uh, or there's a, uh, there's a count that's wrong, and that's how we usually get uh, get involved to start an investigation. Okay, now now the investigation started. How do you? Like, what are the next steps? Like, would you build a task force, or where, where would you go from there? Uh, most places do have a task force. So once drug diversion is suspected, uh, there's usually a, a policy and procedure of who to contact. Usually, it's an HR person. Um, you've got somebody on call that can do a, an on, on-scene drug test. Um, you have uh, a nurse manager, usually a security director or a security manager, um, and they're going to go and meet and look at the case, you know, in totality 
um, and get a game plan, usually risk management or the, uh, the attorney of the facilities involved in this as well. And everybody will concur on which steps uh, seem most appropriate. Uh, you know, every single case is a little unique, a little bit different, and you try to gather as much information as you can, background on the person in question, background on uh, the other people working on the shift, and you try to flush out as many facts as possible and then, you know, start an action plan. You know, typically security uh, protocols is 30 days video retention is usually the industry standard. Uh, what I try to do for any of the cameras that have anything to do with narcotics, the med rooms, the pharmacy, we try to go back a minimum of 90 days. Because generally what we found is when there's a drug diversion and they, they've caught one instance of it, there's usually many, many more, uh, you know, if you have the ability to start looking and, and putting things together. I'd say the majority of my cases, once I start looking at it, I can usually find two or three other instances of the same diversion that uh, wasn't picked up in the use of, uh, of video cameras, access control records, um, you know, is, is proved to be invaluable. And, and you'd mentioned earlier the, what you do with orientations. What are some of the other things we can do to combat drug diversion? Well, basically, it's, uh, you know, it's known as healthcare's dirty little secret. And, you know, as I mentioned, it could be so devastating for the reputation of a hospital that they really want to put forth uh, an effort to have uh, a robust policy, you know, a zero tolerance. Um, and if something does happen, uh, fortunately for, for, you know, the medical staff, um, they can re rehab these people. Uh, it's, it's so prevalent, Brian, that there's, I don't think, in another industry where you'd be given a second thought. If you worked in a bank and you were a teller and you took $100 home uh, every day with you and uh, you did that for six months and then they finally caught you, they wouldn't be sending you to Tron School to turn you around. You'd be fired and you'd be out of a job, but... It's so prevalent in healthcare that they will take a diverter and actually put them in a program and try to rehabilitate them. And a lot of times they're able to get, you know, employment usually uh, in the correction facility system and, and work their way back through again and, and give them a second chance. So, you know, there's a lot of mechanisms that, to help these people. You know, what we found is a lot of times like uh, when, when law enforcement officers get a gun, you know, they treat that gun with the utmost respect, the utmost care. Um, and then after you carry it five or six uh, years, you become you become a little bit more complacent that you have deadly force on your hip. And the same things with the uh, health care providers. You know, they're, they're handling high-powered uh, medications that, you know, can take pain away, you know, within seconds. And uh, when they become uh, new nurses and uh, practitioners, you know, they see that power in there, and then over time, um, they kind of, you know, lose the respect for it, and uh, they can make poor choices. Now, is there any any specific case that you look back on that you were either proud of because you were able to uh, get to the bottom of it, or just a really significant one that stands out in your mind, or even both? Well, interesting. The one I'll share with you was one that was suspected of a drug diversion, I mean, everybody on the task force was absolutely convinced that we had a drug diversion. And what was happening is there was a, uh, a blister pack of, of eight tablets that were uncounted for. So within the two shifts uh, turnover, they did the count, and uh, the, these, uh, these eight tablets uh, were missing. And uh, I personally interviewed the two nurses, and I actually gave them a statement analysis scan questionnaire, which is uh, probably, you know, near uh, near where the uh, lie detector test will, will give you. And both of their responses showed absolutely no deception. And then I interviewed them, and, you know, having the, the read interview technique, I didn't detect any deception at all. And uh, I reported back to... Uh, to the task force that I don't think these two had anything to do with the drug diversion and, and they were convinced that they must. So what I did is uh, in the middle of the night, about 10 o'clock at night, I started thinking about what else could have happened to, to this drug. 
and I called uh, facilities, and I asked them to take apart the cabinet. Uh, and the following morning, uh, they pulled apart the cabinet, and they found the blister pack had had come out of the cabinet and got stuck uh, within the hardware in the back, and all, all eight were accounted for. So, uh, you know, it, it just really tells you to, you know, keep with your science, keep with your process, um, you know, and sometimes uh, things don't turn out the way uh, that people suspect it is, is to uh, to make sure all the facts of the case were in. And I remember uh, Dr. Henry Lee, I studied under him for two days, uh, and he says, don't make assumptions and everything is evidence until it is not. Great. Well, wow. that's, uh, that's actually a really, uh, really great example. Now, I, I want to ask you about something else that you'd spoken about earlier. Uh, you'd made reference to a couple of associations, so IHSS and NADDI. Uh, do you mind talking about those associations a little bit and the, the impact that they've had on your career? Oh, absolutely. Um, when I first uh, got into hospital security, uh, the first thing I did is, is join the local uh, IHSS chapter in New Hampshire and uh, immediately found that, that, that there was a brotherhood of uh, everybody supporting each other, you know, as far as sharing policies and procedures and best practices. And, uh, you know, from there uh, I got into the, uh, the national organization by going to the annual general meetings and really met people like you know, Bonnie Mickelman, Mickelman and uh, Jim Stankovich and uh, Brian Warren, um, you know, all these really wonderful and talented people. And I think just rubbing elbows with that kind of pe- with those folks back then uh, just uh, made you better. You know, if you put a, a goldfish in a small pond, he's only going to get so big. But if you, uh, you put that same fish in a larger uh, environment, you know, the, the size is unlimited. Uh, so I, I really found the IHSS to be absolutely uh, a fantastic organization. Uh, you know, they keep getting better and better, and I think any security director that, that's working in hospitals, uh, it, it should be a must to really, uh, you know, associate with that organization. And then uh, the National Association of Drug Diversion Investigators. I mean, I had uh, a lot of good experience in law enforcement, um, in investigative techniques, but drug diversion and how that whole process works and the different laws and the, you know, federal guidelines with, with narcotics was really uh, a fantastic organization. For the last four years, I've actually been uh, presenting for them. So, uh, you know, I've actually presented for both organizations. So I think it's important that as you build your skill set that you, you pay it forward as well. So it's, it's a give and take relationship with both of those entities. And is there is there anything else you'd like to share in closing? I would say if um, you're you're a security practitioner and uh, you know you've, you've heard this podcast, you probably want to go and and partner up with uh, with your HR people and and your nurse managers and and offer your skill set uh, to help them in these uh, type of drug diversion cases. And, uh, you know, look at best practices as keeping, you know, retention of your your video for a lot longer period than, than you normally would. And, uh, you know, understanding, you know, uh, how that whole system works. What I've always done is before I interview anybody, I'll go to the scene. If it's a med room or a pharmacy, uh, the day before, I'll take pictures. So in an interview setting, when they're trying to describe what, where they were standing or, you know, where this uh, uh, narcotic box was, I could refer to pictures and they're worth a thousand uh, words. And a lot of times I've been able to discount people. I said, well, if you were standing here, then it's it's not correct that uh, you were able to waste over at the sink because the sink is around the other corner. So I think just taking pictures and going to the scene uh, before you conduct one of these investigations is probably a, a big thing to share with uh, the listeners. Awesome. And obviously you've been so willing to share information, and I know that you do have a social media presence. How do you recommend uh, this, the best way to, to touch base with you if we want to connect? Um, I have a LinkedIn profile that, that has both my email and contact information, and that might probably be the easiest for, for most folks is to, to find me on LinkedIn. All right, awesome. All right, well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this, Bill. I really appreciate it, and I'm sure our listeners got a lot of value from this discussion. 
Well, thank you, Brian. I really appreciate uh, your time and being on your show. And I know uh, a lot of uh, a lot of other people have uh, have really enjoyed uh, participating with you. And thank you for all you're doing for the profession. Thank you. This concludes another episode of the Healthcare Security Cast. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week when we have a new guest and a new topic. Thanks again to our sponsor, 3D Network Technology, www.3dnetworktechnology.com. Until next time, take care.